20th century holds a long list of human achievements. That's one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. Air and space travel, computers and information technology, successful organ transplantation. And one of our less celebrated achievements is that we are living longer than ever before. The 21st century promises to be the century of the centenarian, as more and more of us achieve lives of 100 years or more. The number of older people globally has trebled over the past 50 years. And by 2020, half of Europe's population will be aged over 50. This shift in global age structure will prove a significant challenge. Why? Because at the same time, rates of childbearing across the globe are falling. And this means fewer young people entering and driving our societies and economies. The age composition of the 21st century will be as never before, with far fewer children and young people and far more in midlife and old age. Add in the effects of increasing urbanization, migration and climate change, and the implications of this demographic shift are considerable. It will force us to ask fundamental questions. This is not just about more older people. It's not just about individuals living longer. It is everything that is going to change because of this demographic. If we make the mistake of thinking everything apart from the demographic stays the same, then we will be in trouble. In all these changes, there are tremendous opportunities for new as well as existing businesses, from financial services to product design, healthcare to marketing. But the planning and the smart thinking has to start now. So welcome to the Oxford go-to module on how the new population structure of the 21st century will change our world. It says 60 was old, 60, 70. So probably about 16 is old. I'd say when you're past your 20s, 65, 70. I tend to think you're not exactly old until you get up until your late 70s, 80s. The population story of the 21st century isn't about overpopulation, it's about a fundamental change to the age structure of the world's population. We're having children older and we're having fewer of them. Research shows that two thirds of the world's countries are now approaching or below replacement levels. Hong Kong, for example, has the lowest rate in the world with less than one child per woman. Falling fertility rates means there will be fewer younger people to energize our labor markets and crucially, to provide care to the growing numbers of older dependent people within our societies. And it's not just in the developed world, it's a global phenomenon. Some countries such as Germany, Italy, Korea and Japan are concerned that they will not be able to emerge from this low fertility trap and that their economies will suffer as a result. But this will also change markets too. Young individuals tend to produce and consume more than their older counterparts and have a higher rate of saving. An older population arguably spends less and draws down on their savings and investments. So which countries and which economies will be driven by young people over the coming decades? And will these be the best places to invest? Today's generation of young people is going to live much longer lives. Life expectancy is increasing by five hours a day in the UK, two years per decade. Some demographers argue that the real life expectancy of European children is over 100, and that eight million of us currently alive in the UK will live that long. So how would living to 100 make you change your life? I don't know, I could have a job change at 70 or something. I think it would just make me feel less worried. <laughs> You'd consider more careers? Taking time as it comes, not being in a rush. I didn't think I'd actually want to live that long try and make the most of it. That's what I'm trying to do anyway. I think what we are seeing is a huge number of issues being raised by this changing demographic. We're going to have to look at our life course as an individual, our families and our communities and our governments are going to have to look at themselves and say, 
how do we shape our spheres to accommodate these changes. And with a predicted world population of around 10 billion people by 2050, that's almost 3 billion over 60. That's more than today's population of North, Central and South America, Africa, Europe and Russia put together. These longer lives have been made possible by our economic development. Disease and infirmity have been reduced by improvements in public health and care. And now advances in medicine and science promise to lengthen lives even further. The implications are significant. They will affect all our lives and many see it as the greatest challenge of our time. We will have many more people living into their 80s, 90s and 100s who could be an enormous drain on our health and social care economy. A lot of the responsibility in terms of the lifestyle we would like to lead in old age has to rest with the individual. We do need to make sure that government has the resources to ensure that in old age, old age does not equate with poverty. All sorts of big sectors are going to have to change to deal with this. This, this stretching of the life course changes so much about uh, the patterns of, of risks and needs over a lifetime. Research suggests that 75% of this future population will live in urban centres. It will change the way we build homes, how we work and the products we invent. The challenge for the built environment is to become more accessible and more inclusive. So we need to think about how we make our cities more habitable for older people. And this means new transport systems, new designs of streets and new housing so that people can remain in their own homes for longer, closer uh, um, in an intense network of health and social support. We will potentially have the ability to make our home uh, not just a safe environment, but an environment which actually encourages long, healthy, active lives. Advances in medicine, understanding the ageing process, stem cell technology and drug therapy will all make us live even longer. There will be new opportunities, new treatments, new technologies and devices. The key question here is whether these lives will be long and healthy. Our modern lifestyles are encouraging chronic diseases and threats to health that will cause long-term conditions such as obesity and diabetes. Who will provide and pay for increasing long-term care? Our families, the private sector or governments? We have to find a way of affording health care and social care for the many more of us who will be living longer. Just in terms of the sheer economics of it, um, we're going to have to be much more decisive about what we do and don't fund. At the moment, with the pensions industry, um, we have a situation where an increase of life expectancy by five years is equivalent to about a 30% drop in the stock market. There's no doubt that there will be significant change for us all, but while there are clearly challenges ahead, there are also opportunities. Opportunities for policymakers and business leaders to understand the issues and develop strategies. There's going to be all kinds of opportunities um, uh, in terms of business around an ageing society, but we've got to stop looking at it as a burden, a ticking time bomb, a problem for society, and look upon it as the natural evolutionary effects of, of all of us getting older. Well, in my mind, what a sustainable business is, is a business that's delivering a value proposition to consumers. To do that, you really have to understand the customer. And to do that, you have to understand these big, big opportunities and threats that are coming down the pike at us. This unprecedented shift in global age structures raises numerous other questions. We need new ideas and new solutions. So whether you're an academic or a student, a policymaker or a business leader, you can make a difference. You can find more detail in further videos, podcasts, PowerPoints and papers throughout this platform.